Good to see each of you here this evening. Thankful for this opportunity in the middle of the week to be able to gather together, worship our Lord. Let's turn in our hymn books to hymn number 35. We'll sing this together. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven. Hymn number 35. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet thy tribute bring. Ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, evermore his praises sing. Alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Alleluia, praise the everlasting King. Father like he tends and spares us, well our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Alleluia, widely yet his mercy flows. Alleluia, widely yet his mercy flows. Angels in the height adore him, ye behold him face to face. Sun and moon bow down before him, Dwellers all in time and space. Alleluia. Praise with us the God of grace. Alleluia. Praise with us the God of grace. Amen. Well, let's take our Bibles and look together in Ezekiel chapter 43. We finished up last time, Ezekiel 42, with an overview of the temple, what I call the gospel temple. It was a vision that God gave to Ezekiel in a type, in a picture of the work of Christ when he would come to this earth. And he is that temple. He's not the one that the Jews awaited, but when he told them, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up again, he was speaking of his body. And I believe here, just like all the types and pictures that you have in the Old Testament, that's what we have here revealed to Ezekiel. And I believe here in Ezekiel 43, this becomes clearer particularly the spiritual meaning of this portion of Scripture. This vision, as we're going to see going through here, symbolizes the return of the glory of God to this temple. But it's not that physical temple. It's speaking of Christ being that glory of God. We're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 12. It's about as far as we'll be able to get... I believe in this reading. So afterward, it says, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east. Again, when you hear that, think of the sun rising in the east. Think of Christ as the son of righteousness. And so here the Lord is revealing to Ezekiel the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his glory. In the first century, when he would come, light would shine in a dark place. That's where the sun rises in the east. And notice, behold, the glory of God, of, of the God of Israel, came from the way of the east. And his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. This is very much like what we read in the New Testament with regarding the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his voice being as the noise of many waters, in other words, speaking with authority and power, 
over all the earth and shining in his glory. So the gate that faces toward the east, this was where Ezekiel's visionary tour of the temple actually began. You remember back there in Ezekiel chapter 40 and verse 6. And also many years before in a vision, again, after it had departed. Well, it was in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came on this earth. Wherever you see the glory of the God of Israel, don't ask yourself, what is the glory of the God of Israel? But ask who? He is the, the very glory of God. John spoke of that. We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. And so here's where we see the glory of the God of Israel coming again from the way of the east. This is by way of encouragement that even though in Ezekiel's day the glory of the Lord had departed from that temple before it was destroyed, we see here that in this vision hope is given that God would once again appear unto his people but it wouldn't be in the form of a physical temple because even that temple after they came back from 70 years captivity in Babylon they rebuilt the temple but it wasn't the same as Solomon's temple never was in fact people that knew the earlier temple complained that the glory of it wasn't the same it was just but a structure that God raised up for a time but when Christ came and lived on this earth he was the glory of the Lord. And the temple was that which he came to establish in his death, his life and his death, the chief cornerstone. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And that's who we see described here is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ looking forward to when he would come to this earth. It describes his voice like the sound of many waters and the earth shining in his glory. And I believe that just like the sound of a waterfall, the, the sound of many waters or the radiance of the sun shining, all of this is a way in a manner of depicting the Lord Jesus Christ. The very voice of Christ that is like the sound of many waters and is to be, when he speaks, it's to be heard. In fact, those that heard him said, never a man spoke as this man. Well, he's, he's God. He was God in the flesh. He's the one in the beginning that said, let there be light, and there was light. That's who's described here. Now we see Ezekiel's reaction then to what's revealed here in verses 3 through 5. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I, I saw by the river Kabar, and I fell upon my face. When God reveals himself, it might be in different times and seasons and manners, but it's always going to be a word of truth, just like he says here, just like what he saw before. God does not change. And uh, when he speaks, it is that those to whom he speaks and reveals himself might worship him and bow, even as we see Ezekiel during here. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of, of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. So here we have him then describing the glory of the Lord filling this house. We know that the glory of the Lord filled that house by way of judgment. When he brought Babylon against that temple, even though as beautiful as it was that Solomon had built, yet... When the Lord appeared there, it was to be in judgment. That's how it was displayed 
here. We're not given details. We don't know exactly if Ezekiel saw just a, a radiant cloud of God's glory or the elaborate throne chariot that he saw in Ezekiel chapter 1 and again in Ezekiel 8 through 11. But the purpose here of his glory appearing when it says that Verse 4, the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house in that temple. He was carried back here to the, the temple in Jerusalem. And the specific verse here was with reference to the destruction of that temple. Back in Ezekiel 9, 8, Ezekiel said, Ah, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel and pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? So he fell on his face, acknowledging God to be just in his judgments, but at the same time fell on his face, marveling that God would be pleased to show him mercy, even though he was pouring out his wrath on the people. So when it says the glory of the Lord came into the temple, it's talking about that temple in his day. The sense there is that it happened fairly swiftly. There wasn't any delay or hovering. And when the glory of the Lord left the temple, it hovered for a while before it left. But when God purposes to do anything, either by way of salvation or judgment it will be suddenly according to his will and when it says here the glory of the lord filled the temple the spirit brought ezekiel again to see the glory fill the temple he's up in exile and even though we've already seen the destruction of the temple in previous chapters this is almost like coming back again to explain what had taken place and so the prophet's repetition here behold he says the glory of the lord filled the temple that indicates a sense of wonder and amazement so verses six through nine we see god now justifying not that he has to but justifying his destruction of that temple it says in verse 6 and i heard him speaking unto me out of the house and the man stood by me again remember the man is christ in a pre-incarnate state appearing unto him and he said unto me son of man the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile. Neither they nor their kings by their whoredom nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. In their setting of their threshold by my thresholds. And their posts by my posts and the wall between me and them. They have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in mine anger. Now let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in the midst of them forever. But we know that even after Israel was brought back from captivity and that second temple was built, they got right back at their whoredoms. Nothing had changed. Just like after the flood in the days of Noah, as soon as they came out of the ark, sin began to, to populate the earth again. Why? Because they were sinners. And that the salvation wasn't because of any merit in them, but it was because God purposed to use that as an example of his justice in destroying the world, but also his justice in saving a remnant, which was what happened with Noah and his family. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's the only reason why he and his family were preserved. So when he says, I heard him speaking to me from the temple, 
That's the voice of God himself speaking from the temple, showing that the glory of God was active, even though it was about ready to be destroyed. Yet God was working, God was moving. And the man who stood beside him, I believe that this is the same one we saw described back in Ezekiel 40, verses 3 and 4. The radiant man who was none other than Christ himself. And the, the reason I say that is what it says there, this is the place of my throne. For I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel, what forever? Well, how is the Lord now dwelling in the midst of, the Israel, of Israel today? There's not even a temple over there today. Well, it's in the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, his true Israel. Those that he came to save and redeemed. The, the place of his throne is not a physical place like over in Jerusalem. That's been fulfilled. That's been done away. When Christ rose from the grave and ascended on high, he sat down on the throne of David. In other words, that promised seed had ascended and sat on the throne. And so what we have here, a picture then of, of this gospel kingdom where Christ being the temple that he came to build in his body, the foundation having been laid in his coming in the flesh and laying down his life and Christ being the chief cornerstone. That's where that temple is today. You say, well, where is it? It's in Christ. And he indeed dwells among his people. And the foundation has been laid in his person and uh, in his work. So this is a beautiful passage when you consider the promises of God here, even though in Ezekiel's day it appeared that he had completely abandoned his people, but he hadn't abandoned those who were truly his people among the children of Israel. The remnant, according to the election of grace, is the way that Paul described it. But for that day, God in his wrath would completely wipe out the temple and the carcasses with their kings. These would be the dead bodies of the deceased kings that had been buried too near the temple. And uh, they would sacrifice to idols, all of these as dead, stinking, loathsome things in the sight of God. That's, you want a view of what God thinks of false religion. There it is right there. He'll destroy it. When they, they set their threshold by my threshold, they defile my holy name. That's talking about taking what God says and then putting man's works up next to it as if it really doesn't matter. And the plain and clear meaning here is that God will not give his glory to another. And any honor that man seeks to add to the glory of God and his son is to be completely destroyed. When he says, I'll dwell in their midst forever, I believe the plain and clear meaning there is that he dwells among his true Israel forever. In Christ, his son, who would come and fulfill all things. And so, verses 10 to 12, that's as far as we'll get here. God shows his purpose for the detailed description of Ezekiel's temple. Here's the part where, you know, while we're reading through it, you're wondering, what's the end of all this? Well, here it is right here in verses 10 through 12. Thou, son of man, show the house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. Remember the pattern? Just like the Lord said to Moses, make the pattern of that tabernacle exactly like I show you because it is a pattern of the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle, which is Christ. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof, and the goings out thereof, and the comings in thereof, and all the forms thereof, 
and all the ordinances thereof, and all the forms thereof, and all the laws thereof, and write it in their sight, that they may keep the whole form thereof and all the ordinances thereof and do them. Well, what, what was he doing by showing them the form of the house and the fashion thereof? He was teaching them how these things revealed Christ. Because we know in the Old Testament, the spirit of Christ that was in them spoke of Christ and the, the sufferings that he was to suffer and the glory that should follow. So he was not just showing them the architecture of what the Lord had revealed to him, but he was giving the sense and the significance of how all of this pertained to God's glory and his holiness and justice and how he's God and how he shows mercy. And he says to make known to them how through the preaching and teaching. Just like when they came back from captivity, Ezra again took up the law and began to teach the people why it was important for them to offer sacrifices and to, to reestablish the priesthood because they all pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't just preaching law. He was preaching Christ. And I believe that's the sense here when the Lord said to Ezekiel, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangements, just like we've been reading through, looking for Christ, seeing how all this pertains to him. This is what Ezekiel was to do now with those that were in exile with him. And even after the destruction of the temple, continue to teach them the significance of what that temple was all about. All of that was to be done until Christ himself came and was revealed. And you'll notice in verse 12, every word of scripture is important. Here it says, this is the law of the house. Upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. Well, you stop and think, what is the law of the house? I believe there that it's referring to the new covenant. When he's talking about the house, he's talking about this house that Christ built and what this all represented and what is the law. But here he says, holiness under the Lord round about shall be most holy. So what this is showing is again, how God will be approached and that his holiness can only be answered in this one who was to come and fulfill all righteousness. And that is in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel is a law of the house. Whose house? Christ's house. It's not rules and regulations, but it's the word law literally there means the teaching of the house. And when Christ came, he established a new covenant over his house, not like the one that had been established before in types and pictures and promises and uh, with all of the, the regulations pertaining to it. But now with regard to him as being the fulfiller of all these things, he is the law then of the house. This is the law of faith, not of works, but of faith. And it pertains to the holiness of God. Why did Christ come? Why did he establish a house whose foundation can never be shaken? Well, it's because everything up to that point had been temporal. And nothing man could do could preserve it or keep it or establish it. So it took Christ coming. And he's the fulfillment of his house. He's the priest. He's the sacrifice. And uh, he is the one through whom God will be worshipped. When it says there that upon the top of the mountain, the whole limit thereof round about shall be most holy. That's where Christ was sacrificed on the top of the mountain. That's where the foundation was laid of this new house that uh, Ezekiel had just seen the, the vision pertaining to Christ and his church. And it's repeated twice. Behold, this is the law of the house. It's, it's founded on Christ and Christ alone and him crucified.
But we'll stop there for now and continue on next time, Lord willing, in this chapter. Gracious Father, I thank you for this time in your word. We continue to look to you for wisdom and direction and understanding. How all of this pertains to Christ in our own feeble minds, we never would or could. But by your spirit, you continue to teach us. And I pray that in the end, we would see how all this redounds to your glory, the glory of your son, and how it is you're to be worshipped. And we give you the praise and glory and honor in his precious name. Amen. Let's turn to hymn number 226. 226. My Savior, I am not skilled to understand what God hath willed, what God hath planned. I only know at his right hand is one who is my Savior. I take him at his word indeed. Christ died for sinners, this I read. For in my heart I find a need of him to be my Savior. That he should leave his place on high and come for sinful man to die. You count it strange, so once did I, before I knew my Savior. And oh, that he fulfilled may see the travel of his soul in me, and with his work contented be, as I with my dear Savior. Yea, living, dying, let me bring my strength, my solace from this spring, that he who lives to be my king once died to be my Savior. Great little hymn, full of truth, full of Christ. Let's take our Bibles and look together in Luke chapter 2. We continue our study through the different titles of Christ. We're in the seas right now, and what we're going to see in this message is Christ, the consolation of Israel. Consolation of Israel. Just what does that mean? Well, that's taken from what we read here in Luke chapter 2 and verse 25, where... This has to do with Simeon. It says there in verse 25, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem. This is when Mary and Joseph had brought the baby Jesus, the eighth day to be circumcised according to the law. He came to fulfill the law, so even in that, he was circumcised. But it says, Whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout. And here it is, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. So when Mary and Joseph went to the temple in Jerusalem to follow the requirements of the law after the birth of Jesus, here's where the Spirit of God directed them to this man, Simeon. He's described there as a just and devout man. In other words, one who followed the instruction of the Lord. That's why he was at the temple. He believed that until Christ should come, that those sacrifices that were offered there would be a covering for his sin. And he was devout in that he did not seek any other way. Those that were in the Old Testament, I know we're reading in the New, but until Christ actually came and paid to sin debt, the Old Testament era was still in force. And so these sacrifices were offered, and that's why we find Simeon here at the temple. Not because he put any confidence in those sacrifices as far as putting away sin, because we know that the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin, but because of 
who those sacrifices represented. And it's clear here, it says he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. And that's why, as you continue to read, it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost. There's no way anybody can have a true hope here in looking to Christ other than it being revealed by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Remember, we've already studied that. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. There's times where you're directed, perhaps without really knowing that God's directing, and you end up in a certain place, and then looking back, you realize it was the Lord directing all the while. I don't believe this was in the sense of an audible talking in his ear to go to the temple, but as was his custom, he went to the temple, but at the particular time, this time, the Spirit was directing in such a way as he would encounter the very one for whom he had been waiting. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Imagine all the people milling about in that temple and the Lord directs him to Mary and Joseph and that little baby Jesus. There was nothing outwardly to distinguish him from any other babies that were being brought the eighth day for the circumcision according to the law. But it was the spirit that caused him to look upon that child, take him up in his arms and then declare, verse 29, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. And here it is. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. So when it says here that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, this is not just some sort of touchy-feely waiting and I can't wait for the day when I can see Jesus type thing. To wait for the consolation of Israel here was actually to wait on him who was his salvation. And that gives us a sense then as to the meaning of the term consolation. He says, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people. Even there the Spirit had taught him that this one who was to come according to the scriptures. Say, how was he waiting? Well, he had the scriptures. The Old Testament spoke of him who was to come, and the Gospels speak of him who did come, has come. And the epistles, him who is coming again. But even here, he recognized something that many did not. There were Jews who were waiting for a Messiah to come to establish a Jewish nation. But here, in what the Spirit had revealed unto him, Notice, thou hast prepared before the face of all people. That word all people has to do with the nations. And it says in verse 32, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. That shows right there that when Christ came, it wasn't just for Jews. It was for Jew and Gentile that the Father had given him even before the foundation of the world, the elect throughout the world. And it says Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And that's where Simeon goes on and bless, blesses Mary, but tells her in verse 35, a sword shall pierce through thy own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. She would see her son crucified. And as a mother, you could imagine how traumatic that would have been. And yet, at the same time, it would be because even for her own sin that uh, it was necessary that he should die. So the consolation that we see here in verse 25, it's referring to the promised Messiah. And that's what we're looking at. Different titles given to Christ. The word Messiah means Christ, Christ the Messiah. Waiting for the consolation of Israel means that he was waiting for the Messiah, the Christ, as were all of those in the Old Testament that the Lord had taught. Their eyes were forward-looking 
everything that was given to them in type and picture and prophecy and promise had to do with this one who was the consolation of Israel. The word consolation means to give comfort by their appearing. We can sense that of a loved one. You're waiting for them to arrive and then suddenly you see them and all of a sudden your heart is at peace and resting because now you've seen them. This term is often applied to Christ even before he actually appeared. And the Jews even had a custom if they wanted to make sure that the person they were lying to would, would believe them. They would often say, I swear by the consolation of Israel. And they would use it as even for false testimony. That gives it, you an idea that the heart has always been what it is. But the word actually in the Greek, it's the same root as the word paraclete, which means to call to one side, to have one come alongside of another by way of encouragement or strengthening. And certainly the Lord had told his disciples that when he ascended on high, he would send another comforter, is the way it's put there in John 15 and John 16. Well, when it says another, he's speaking of the Spirit being given. He would not leave them orphans, but one like himself, being an advocate, that the Spirit should come and be their consolation or their comfort. You can look this word up in your concordance online and see that it's used 29 different times in the New Testament. Sometimes it, the word comfort is used. Sometimes the word exhortation is used as being the Lord giving you a word by his word of exhortation and then consolation. So that's what the word means. Secondly, how is Christ the consolation of Israel? That's what we want to see here. The Messiah, the consolation of Israel, his purpose in coming was to remove everything that was the cause of sorrow and grief to his people. What is it that is the, the cause of sorrow and grief to those who are the Lord's if it's not our sin? And so he didn't just come alongside to console people and try to make them feel better in their sin and depravity. No, it required him to come and actually be the substitute. And so when the scriptures speak of Simeon waiting for the consolation of Israel, he knowing the scriptures, knew that the scriptures had predicted that the Messiah would actually come for that purpose, to be the substitute of his people. Look in Isaiah chapter 40. This is a chapter that I believe we know well. And in Isaiah chapter 40, this is what the Lord said to Isaiah. It's a different word in the Hebrew. But it's the same meaning as we have in the Greek in the New Testament, consolation. Another way you could read this in Isaiah 40 and verse 1 where it says, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith our God. Console ye, console ye, my people, saith the Lord. It would be the, the same sense. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her. Now this is why... I said that for Christ to be the consolation, it wasn't just a matter of him coming along and pepping people up and making them feel better. No, there was a just satisfaction that had to be made. And that's why it says here that her warfare is accomplished. So he's telling Isaiah to speak in a manner forward looking to when Christ would appear and accomplish the warfare for his people. Well, what warfare? Well, 
There's the warfare of sin against the people. There's the condemnation of the law. There's Satan. There's the world. All of these. But her warfare is accomplished. How? Well, it says that her iniquity is pardoned. In Scripture, when you read, the only way that iniquity can be pardoned is through the bloodshed of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't pardoned until he actually came and shed his blood. Everything else up to that point was under the forbearance of God. There was a temporal withholding of his judgment from his people there in the Old Testament. But the blood of bulls and goats couldn't put away sin. There was none that could say they'd been redeemed or justified or pardoned in the Old Testament through that Old Testament sacrifice system. Now it took Christ coming. And then it says there, the secondly, so it's a matter of sin being dealt with, which was done through his death. But secondly, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. That's the thing we see about Christ's work. It wasn't just that sin was put away, but also that righteousness was imputed. There was a double working of God on behalf of his people, putting away the sin, but also the imputing of that righteousness so that when it was all said and done, there would be that righteousness which would answer to the very righteousness of God. So that's the consolation. And I truly believe that it says here that the spirit was on Simeon. The fact that he was waiting for the consolation. He was waiting for this one that the Old Testament prophesied should come. And therefore God had revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he'd actually beheld the Lord's Christ. The Lord's Messiah. The Lord's Savior. God didn't just pardon sin by looking the other way. No, it required a just satisfaction. And so for him to be the consolation of Israel, another way of seeing that is that he would be the one who would actually come and fulfill all of the promises of God, going all the way back from the beginning through Abraham and David, those covenants. He would be the one who would come and would work out the salvation of his people. So after all these years of waiting, I don't know how old Simeon was, but he had been waiting ever since the Spirit began that work in his heart. Just like any there in the Old Testament, the only way they could even look to Christ would have been through the Spirit doing that work in their heart. But after all that time, yet he had this consolation himself that he would not die until he had actually seen the Lord's Christ. There's a lesson in there for us as well, I believe, and that is that any that God has chosen and that Christ has come and redeemed and paid their sin debt, they're not going to die until they have seen the Lord's Christ. Nobody's going to wake up in heaven wondering how they got there. They'll see the Lord's Christ, just like the thief on the cross. Right up to that last second, suddenly his eyes were opened. And he asked the Lord to remember him when he came in his kingdom. Well, here was a man dying on the cross. How on earth could he see him as a king other than that the Spirit had worked in his heart and so revealed him? And I believe that's the way it is. There's not going to be one that God has purposed to save and for whom Christ came into this world that in time is not going to see the Lord's Christ. It might be early for some, it might be later for others, but it's going to be in the Lord's time. And if we have seen the Lord's Christ through his word, not physically, but through his word and literally if you will, taken him in our arms and embraced him, just like Simeon did, it's going to be because the Lord has purposed that he be our consolation. There were many in Israel that when he came did not see him, even that day that he was there in the temple. It wasn't to everybody, 
that this was revealed. And nor did Simeon start yelling, hey, here's the Lord's Christ. No, he knew that this was particular to him, that God had been pleased to give him that hope for this consolation. So the consolation that he had to Israel, natural Israel, looking for a, a victorious Messiah that would come and overthrow the government. And that's why they turned thumbs down on Christ, because he told them, my kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, would my servants fight? And so they crucified him. But the consolation for one like Simeon and any for whom the Lord had paid the debt was the weight of their own sin, knowing the sinfulness of their sin, knowing that apart from him coming and paying the debt, there would be no hope. People that look to their works or their zeal or to their efforts or whatever, other than Christ alone, there, there's no comfort there. It might soothe their conscience a little bit while they're going about doing these things, but God calls all that filthy rags. If righteousness come by law, Paul said there in Galatians 2.21, then Christ is dead in vain. If you're saying that you could work this out yourself, and you're saying Christ didn't need to come, I don't know of any that the Lord has taught would ever say that. Now there was here the need shown. And this is what it meant for him waiting for the consolation of Israel. I believe that this is important even for us because we might have some concern for our acquaintances and loved ones, family members and others. But you cannot give them this consolation or this waiting on the Lord where the Lord must do the work. He's the one by his spirit that must cause them to, to long for and seek after. That word waiting there in verse 25 for the consolation isn't just a passive when people walk by. What are you sitting around doing, Simeon? Oh, I'm just sitting here waiting. No, there was in the heart by the spirit of God a yearning and a longing, but at the same time a waiting for the Lord himself to reveal himself and uh, that that one when he was revealed would be the one who would take away his sin you can see in psalm 38 going back to david we've been looking at simeon here but david being also one of the lords in the old testament you can see how he expresses his desire in psalm 38 this would be the waiting, the waiting on the Lord. And this is what I listen for. I'm not just interested in a man's profession telling me what he knows of Jesus or Christ or when he made his decision, all these things that you hear people talking about today. When did the Lord cause you to wait on him and to seek him? When were you ever lost? That would probably be the better question to ask people than what you hear people say, when were you saved? Well, if Christ paid your sin debt, you were saved at the cross. I'd like to know when you were lost. When was there ever that hungering and thirsting and yearning that the Spirit gives? Just like we see here in Psalm 38, where David said in verse 4, Mine iniquities are gone over mine head. As an heavy burden, they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. So even though here it says of Simeon that he was a just and devout man, the reason he was described as just is because he didn't put any confidence in his flesh. And he was devoted to that one who was to come that the Spirit had revealed in him through the Old Testament Scriptures. But David says here, I am troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. We know that that was the case with Simeon. As he got older, the one promise he had on which to lean was that the Spirit had revealed unto him that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. But he didn't know when, where, or how. And so as he was doing what he normally did, going to the temple, 
and offering those sacrifices in the view of the, the one who was to come, yet until he saw him, Christ, he had a mournful spirit. He said, my loins are filled with a loathsome disease, and there is no soundness in my flesh. I am feeble and sore, broken. I have roared by reason of the disquietness of my heart. But what, Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. My heart panteth. My strength faileth me, as for the light of mine eyes, it also is gone from me. But his hope was in the Lord. That's what we see with David, even as it is, I believe, with any that the Lord is drawing. But before, as I said, Christ ascended after his death and resurrection, he promised to send another comforter in the person of his spirit. In John chapter 14 and verse 16, if you look there, John 14, 16. We're not left without a consolation. We're not left without a comforter. The paraclete, that's what this word is here. In John 14 and verse 16, the Lord said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, one like me, another like me. And that's that word, consolation, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he what dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And he says, I will not leave you comfortless. That's that same word, without consolation. What a blessed promise that is. He says, I will come to you. That's important to see too. It wasn't Simeon that came, found the Lord. It was the Lord that came to him. The Spirit directed him there. And uh, when he saw the Christ child, he took him in his arms and said, What now mine eyes have seen, thy salvation. The Holy Spirit consoles, but Christ is the consolation. When he says here, waiting for the consolation of Israel, he wasn't waiting for some experience, Holy Ghost experience like you hear people talking about. No, he was waiting for Christ. And to use the figure, the Lord Jesus himself, like the great physician, is the consolation. The spirit is the medicine or the balm. It's Christ who gives his spirit, but it's by Christ's stripes that we're healed. That's what Peter spoke of, his shed blood. And the, the spirit is the one that brings that home to the heart and applies to the heart of one of the Lord's all the blessings and benefits of what Christ procured in uh, his coming, doing, and dying. So the way that God is glorified is that the Spirit takes the things of Christ. He doesn't show them unto angels. Even the angels were finding out as all of this unfolded. They looked into these things. They were curious. They, angels don't have omniscience like Christ. And Christ didn't blast it across the sky like you, you would think, okay, Here's the Christ. No, but revealed Christ in them. In John 16 and verse 13, that's how it's described, the consolation of Israel, how, how Christ is made to be our comfort and consolation. It says, how be it, John 16, 13, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Who? His elect. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that will he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. That's how Christ is made to be our consolation. It's through his spirit. Well, I hope that's helpful. Certainly all of scripture points to him and uh, he came and fulfilled all that was required 
of him, that God might be just to justify that people that the Father gave him. Well, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 172. This describes who Christ is as the Word of God incarnate. Incarnate means come in the flesh. O Word of God incarnate, O wisdom from on high, O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of our dark sky, we praise Thee for the radiance that from the hallowed page a lantern to our footsteps shines on from age to age. The church from her dear master receive the gift divine. And still that light she lifteth for all the earth to shine. It is the golden casket where gems of truth are stored. It is the heaven-drawn picture of Christ the living Word. It floateth like a banner before God's host unfurled. It shineth like a beacon above the darkling world. It is the chart and compass that o'er life's surging sea, mid mists and rocks and quicksands, still guides, O Christ, to Thee. O oh, make thy church, dear Savior, a lamp of purest gold to be before the nations thy true light as of old. O oh, teach thy wandering pilgrims by this their path to trace Till clouds and darkness ended, they see thee face to face. That truly is our hope, consolation, to see him face to face one day. All right, with that, we'll be dismissed and look forward to our next time. Lord willing.